Solutions. Um, uh, we were very happy, as always, to collaborate with the friends at the Legal Library. And this is a wonderful subject matter tonight of, of interest for all of us. But I would like to tell you also that we have some upcoming programs. And uh, the first one would be Mount 14. We have a trivia night as a fundraiser at Cary Cabin. And uh, you certainly can, and people can play for $10 and uh, go to the club. And then Sunday, March 16th, we have the Merry Minstrels. Uh, at the Greek Orthodox Church. They were wonderful in opening up their church for us, and it will be for the Irish music, obviously, because everybody is Irish on St. Patrick's Day. And then we have, on March 22nd, um, we've researched and done over almost close to 300 photos of Ruben's homes that are lost in our older homes that are you know, here now, and a history of them. And it's an exhibit that will be at the Burdette Mansion. The open house is uh, March 22nd from 10 to 2, and then we will keep it open through May, because we're going to do the scavenger hunt again for our third graders of the schools, all of the schools, and that will be one of the stops that the kids will have to make. And then we have um, a bus trip coming up. Uh, we did our first one in um, at Gettysburg this September. We had a blast. We had 53 people. And this year we're going to go to um, Washington, D.C. and see the World War II monument and other sites uh, in Washington. So we hope if you're interested, you'll join us. Thank you very much, and uh, have a great night watching this program. Thank you. We'll now have a few opening remarks from Mr. Scott Galvin, our mayor. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here and uh, follow Kathy Lucero from the Movement Historical Society and, and the group that they have put together does a fantastic job uh, all through the year providing great programs for the city. So thanks, Kathy, and the members of the Historical Society for what you do. It's a great uh, effort. I'm glad to be here tonight uh, on behalf of the Public Library and of the Historical Society uh, to put on this show about reading and the importance of reading throughout the city. And uh, when I first walked in, I was taken back by the pictures of these, these great paintings done by our eighth grade students, uh, which to me is pretty amazing, but, uh, the quality of artwork that we're getting from our students. And it's... Uh, it's a great reflection on our schools as well as our kids. So if any of you are here tonight, uh, if you could stand up, we could recognize you. Any eighth grade students here? No? No? Great paintings, though, anyway. So glad to be here. I'd just like to read a proclamation to kick off the reading week. Uh, we also started the reading uh, Read Across America in the elementary schools, and I had the pleasure to read to uh, the first grade students over at the Goodyear School, and they were great kids. Uh, and it's always great to get out and read and do the reading. So. If you'd be with me, uh, Wuben Reads 2014 is a community-wide reading event. Whereas Wuben Reads is a citywide program that encourages residents to read a common book and attend related special events from early March to early April, including this evening's Stealing Rembrandt's presentation and display of artwork from Joyce Middle School students. And whereas Wuben Reads 2014 is being organized by the Friends of the Wuben Public Library and the Wuben Historical Society, and funded by donations made in memory of Sheila Joyce Greenlaw, a devoted member of the Friends. And whereas Wuben Reads 2014 is a welcome addition to a long list of great educational community programs sponsored by the Friends of Wuben Public Library that brings together residents of all ages to engage in fun, inclusive, and educational cultural activities. Whereas the architecture that claims Wuben Public Library has been serving the people of Wuben since 1856, and now offers a collection of more than 60,000 items, including books, videos, DVDs, books on tape, and CD, large print books, magazines, newspapers, and a great place to go. Now, therefore, I, Scott Galvin, Mayor of the City of Wuben, do hereby kick off Wuben Reads 2014 by thanking all its sponsors and organizers and encouraging all of Wuben residents to support and participate in this worthwhile program that runs through April. So thank you very much to the Public Library. Have a great evening. I just wanted to spend a minute and introduce a few other special guests. Kathy Agardi, the director of the library, is here somewhere. Kathy, give us a wave. And Andrea Bunker, the assistant director, is right beside her. Also, Terry Toronto, who is um, leading and helping the students at the Ruben High Book Club.
Club, which is new this year. And some of those students are there, so wave your hands, everybody. There's four of them, actually, at the end. And if Nancy Borelli would also raise her hand, um, Nancy worked tirelessly with the eighth grade students at the Joyce. They studied the Gardner Art Heist. They learned about the painters, and they produced their own wonderful masterpieces. If you haven't had time, be sure that you get to see them. They are wonderful. And there are, I think, four in the lobby as well. Also, Andrea Bunker has a teen group book club at the public library. Whoop and Reads, this year we've selected Barbara Shapiro's The Art Forger, a story that tells the tale of Claire Ross. She's a disgraced artist who might get her wish come true. Someone has offered to give her a show at a very famous gallery. If only she would make a copy of a Degas for him. Turns out the Degas is from the Gardner Heist. What should she do? You have to read the book to find out. <laughs> we have some at the library and they're there for circulation. Um, also at the library, Ruben has some missing artwork of its own. Look up when you are at the circulation desk and you'll find, see some places where we're missing some art. Um, as the mayor said, Sheila Joyce Greenlaw was a founding member of the Friends and the, all of our events are funded by money made in memory of, of her to the Friends of the Moving Public Library. The Friends could not put, out, put on such a program without other Friends. Tonight, it's the Wuban Historical Society who has supported us in having Anthony Mori come to speak about the Gardner Heights. Next week, we have the Wuban Guild of Artists come to the library. You'll learn about the imagination and inspiration of artists while someone paints a painting at the same time. The Senior Center has been very helpful. We have a book discussion there, and we have a film series of classic heists and capers from the 50s and 60s. Burbine Free Lecture Series is bringing us the author, Barbara Shapiro. She's a hoot. I think you'll have a great time. The library is also providing a discussion, and at the library we're having two events about Isabella Stewart Gardner and her museum. Unfortunately, the key is all booked up. It's waitlisted, but you can come and see Jessica Paella do a presentation on Isabella Stewart Gardner. But there's still room to get a place on the bus that's going to the Gardner Museum on April 2nd. Um, Anthony Mori is here tonight to tell us the story of how Rembrandt's, and you can see several right here, happened to become one of the most commonly stolen paintings. And New England has an interesting history <laughs> where this comes. He is the director of security at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, and I'll answer the question everybody's thinking about. He wasn't the director of security when the museum was robbed. He's also the chief investigator of the theft. Um, if you can find paintings before he does, it's what, five million? Five million reward. I could think of several places I could spend five million dollars. Prior to this, he was, and I have to read this out because I couldn't memorize this, Assistant Federal Security Director of the Transportation Security Administration. After 9-11, he helped work on better security for Logan. He's well known for writing in the Boston Herald and the Huffington Post on security, lectures um, on art theft. But tonight we're going to learn about these Rembrandts that keep getting stolen. And if you, I was even surprised myself at how valuable all the artwork was. $500 million worth of art was taken. That's what it's worth now from that museum. Um, the Worcester Art Museum has also had a Rembrandt taken, and the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. When Mr. Morris finished, we'll do some questioning and answering, and he has a few books to sign. And I'm think, I think you're in for a great time because he's a good speaker. Mr. Morris. Thank you very much. I was going to take that. Steal. My next book was going to be Stealing 
proclamation. Thank you, uh, everybody, for coming tonight. Thank you uh, to the Woburn Historical Society and the uh, library for having me. I uh, appreciate you braving the cold weathers to come out and hear about something uh, as unusual as art theft, but that's what I do for a living, so I'm, I'm excited to talk to you about it. Um, as was mentioned, I am the director of security at the Godner, and I'm the chief investigator. And I always like to emphasize chief investigator because I'm also the only investigator. And I like to be able to say that whenever I can, chief investigator. Doesn't work well in the museum because they know I'm the only one here. But um, how many of you, a, a couple of times I'm gonna ask you to give me a quick show of hands, but how many of you have not been to the Godner before? Far too many, far too many. You should go on this trip that you mentioned. If you can't make it on that trip, you should uh, journey into Boston any day except Tuesday when we're closed and, and check out the museum. It's something to behold. Um, I've been at the museum for eight and a half years, and that's how long I've been looking for these paintings. And I want to just tell you a little bit about my background to tell you how I got to write this book and, and what it teaches us about art theft. So I spent 15 years of my career before the museum working in what are now considered Homeland Security agencies. I worked for immigration, I was a special agent with the FAA, and then after 9-11, I became the Assistant Federal Security Director when we had to rebuild security at Logan. And uh, Transportation Security Administration was mentioned. I know it's one of those agencies everybody loves to hate. But I ask you, to, every, anytime people ask you about the TSA, I ask you to think back to September 12th, 2001. And all the polls at that time around the country, people believed with 90% with certainty, 90% of Americans believed that we would be attacked again and that airplanes would be falling out of the sky. And 13 years down the road, now, none of that has happened. And that's a big reason why. So next time you're traveling, and you're standing in a long line, and you see these people going through bags, just try to think of that, you know, what it was like back then around that time. Now, I do a lot of speeches with Howie Carr, too. So Howie's audiences hate the TSA a lot. So I, don't, I have to give that pitch. Eight and a half years ago, I was going through the Boston Sunday Globe, and I was in the classified section, and I was just perusing. I wasn't really looking for a job, and I saw this very small advertisement for security director Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. It was one of those very small two-line, three-line ads, and I remember thinking, this is that museum that had that massive theft, and this is what they're doing to find a new security director. Tiny little ad in the back. And I, I'm kind of quirky with stuff like that, so I applied because I wanted to see what was going on here. And those of you who've been to the garden, you know this amazing court, courtyard, right? The most incredible thing you ever saw, especially the first time you saw it. So I've never been there. I went for the interview. And for leadership positions, they often interview you right at the courtyard. And I couldn't believe my eyes. I had spent 15 years basically on, um, in, in airports and on uh, shipping docks in South Boston. And then all of a sudden, I'm in this place. I said, whoa, I might be interested in working here. And I got the job. And um, when I started, I knew part of my mandate was to find these stolen paintings. But I knew nothing about art theft. Everything I knew about art theft I had seen in the movies, like many of you. So I said, how do I get myself up to speed? My whole career was spent looking at, basically, Arab terrorists. Now I have to start thinking about who steals art. Right? So I thought about the films I'd seen. Then I said, you know, the best way to do this is to create an MO, to, to go into every art theft that's happened in the last hundred years and, and take all the details and catalog them into a big database to see what type of trends I could find. So I spent a couple of hours doing that, and I stopped because I learned immediately that art theft is way too big an enterprise for me to do a quick MO. I've learned that six to eight billion dollars per year worth of art is stolen or looted or forged or trafficked or what have you. It's massive. It's third only after drugs and guns. So I said, I better narrow my focus. And I went, well, at the Gardner in 1990, there were three Rembrandts stolen. And they were stolen in a pretty unique way. So let me just focus on Rembrandt. So I looked at all of those from the past hundred years, and that was much more manageable. And I've learned a lot about a lot about art crime. There were 81 Rembrandt thefts in the past hundred years. And as I took these stories and created my profile, 
I said, you know, these will make an interesting book someday. And they did. They made this book, Stealing Rembrandt. Now, I want to talk to you about what I've learned, because it's vastly different from what you know about art theft. I have to go back and prep this. So. This is the myth of art theft. This is what you all think of, probably, when you think about people stealing art. I can't tell you how many times I meet a new person, and they ask what I do for a living, and they go, ah, oh, Thomas Crown. And I say, well, Thomas Crown stole paintings. I try to find paintings. I don't look like Pierce Brosnan at all. But um, this is what you know of art crime. And it's no insult to anybody to say that, because how else would you know? How many of you in this audience tonight have had a great masterpiece, a multi-million dollar masterpiece stolen from your home? This guy had to think about it a bit, but nobody, right? So how would you know? You know from what you see in the popular media. And this is what you see. You see Thomas Brown, the old Thomas Brown film, Stephen Queen. Has anybody seen this movie, Entrapment? Sean Connery and Captain Zeta Jones. It's on paper, it's not pay-per-view, it's on demand right now, HBO or Showtime. But there's a great scene in this movie where Catherine Zeta Jones is practicing to learn what art thieves do. And she's crawling through these red laser beams, and she's blindfolded when she's doing it. And that that's the perfect example of how foolish these movies are. Right? There are no red laser beams that you can see on the floor. And it, why would we want them to be visible so that the bad guys would know what to step around? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So that, but that's what you know about art theft, right? You, you know it from these films. These are real art thieves. And I chose these pictures because these are Massachusetts art thieves. And here's something for you all to sit up in your chair and be proud about. One of the things I learned is that Massachusetts is a hotbed for art theft. If I, if I was going to name the three states where it happens most, I'd say Massachusetts, New York, and California. So we can all add art theft to what, what we're proud of here with murder and mayhem and fraud and speakers of the house going to prison and uh, you name it. Art theft is way up there too. Basically, for frame of reference for you, if you're a great artist and, you're, and your works are worth a lot of money and someone puts them up in Massachusetts, there's a good chance someone's going to steal them or at least try to. These guys have done it. Now, the guy in the top left, his name is Florian Monday. Okay, but some of you in the audience might remember a show that used to be called to, uh, Catch a Thief. Robert Wagner. His character's name is Al Monday. So this guy up in the top left-hand corner was a petty thief. So everybody started calling him Al Monday instead of Florian Monday. So he goes by Al now. And he's a friend of mine today. He's a friend of mine. And the guy in the center is a cohort of his named David Aquafresca. So remember these two guys because... The first art theft I want to tell you about was 1972 in Worcester, and it was mastermind by Al Monday. Now, Al learned about art at his mother's knee. His mother was a great lover of antiques and art, and she uh, taught her sons what she knew. And she didn't teach him this stuff because she wanted them to become thieves and steal it. She wanted to bestow her love for art in her children, but Al was a wayward child. And he saw opportunities as he got older. So he ventured towards the life of crime. That's not good, is it? It's still low? I'll hold it if I have to. Is that better? Okay. I can't yell all night. So Al um, looked towards stealing stuff. That was his thing. And he was taking classes at Assumption College. And he got the idea, hey, maybe I'll steal some paintings from Worcester Art Museum which is basically across the street. Has anyone here been to the Worcester Art Museum? You know, if you've been there, it's a great museum. If it was in any other major city, it would be renowned, but it's in Worcester. So who ventures out to Worcester? I mean, you guys are in Woburn, and you won't drive out there. So. Al, Al's theft is a great example of why art thieves do what they do. He, he went about looking at what he could steal to make money. He felt, if I steal some paintings from this museum, I can sell them. And even if I get pennies on the dollar, if I steal millions of dollars worth of paintings, I'm going to come away with a lot of money. So when he went in the museum and looked for what he was going to steal, he didn't look for what was his favorite or what he thought some collector out in Japan would want, like most people think art theft uh, is motivated by. He went and said, which ones are most valuable? 
So he settled on four. He settled on a painting by Rembrandt. He settled on two Gauguin paintings and a Picasso. And he set up the plan pretty elaborately. First, he picked the guys who were going to do it, and they were just low-level criminals, which is the case in all major art theft. They're just low-level criminals who do all kinds of stuff. They're not Tom Cruise rappelling through a skylight, dressed in black, uh, wearing balaclava. They're guys who rob uh, liquor stores, banks, home invasions, that sort of thing. So he gets a couple of those, a couple of young guys. And then he gets the guy I showed you up there, David Aquafresca, and he tells him to steal a car. And David Aquafresca steals car like cars like you and I breathe air. Piece of cake. Don't worry about it. Then he goes to his sister-in-law. Al goes to his sister-in-law, and he, gets, he has the dimensions of the paintings he wants to steal, and he asks her to sew some velvet bags to put the paintings in when they're stolen. And of course he does it, because you know when your brother-in-law comes to you and says, I need you to sew up some bags for me to steal some paintings from a museum. You're like, sure, no problem. That's what, that's what family's for. So now the plan is set, and Al sets the plan to, uh, for the theft to occur in the middle of the day, broad daylight at, at the Worcester Museum. Most people picture museum thefts happening overnight. You just, from the movies or whatever, you intuit that they're going to do it overnight. But in all of the research I've done, I've continued looking at art thefts. I've studied over 1,300 art thefts now, and I found that just over half of them occur in broad daylight. And there's a reason for that. I mean, the museum's open. You don't have to think, how am I going to get past the alarms? How am I going to break into the building? Are the night guards armed? Instead, you just walk in. You know, step one is done. Place is wide open. Al takes two guys and tells them uh, to wear blue windbreakers. And he gives them these blue windbreakers because he feels that that'll make them sort of look like employees at the museum. And it makes sense because of all of the times that any of you have been to museums, you probably haven't seen employees taking a painting off a wall, right? That usually happens when they're closed. So the theory is if these guys go in and they take these paintings down like it's nobody's business and they look like they work there, maybe no one will say anything. It's a good plan. The other thing is he gave them um, ski masks. Those might tip you off, especially if it's May, which is when the theft was going to happen. But, so they put the masks on, and they kept them rolled up on their head. Um, and that was the plan. And when he had the car stolen by Aqua Fresca, he gave him very specific instructions. I want you to steal a, a station wagon. And many of you will remember, in 1972, a station wagon was a big car, very big, with a big way back, right? And the reason for that was because the Gauguin painting is very large and a big wood on a wooden panel, and it wouldn't fit well in the back seat of a car. So no problem. I, as I mentioned, Aquafresca steals the car. The day comes for the, for the art theft to occur. And as the two guys are ready to leave, and Al gives them their final briefing, they stop and they say, where's our gun? And Al says, you don't need a gun. There's no gun is not a part of this robbery. We've gone to the museum, you've seen the guards, they're all elderly, they're all slight of build, and they're not armed. What do you need a gun for? And the two thieves say, we're not doing this without a gun. Well, Al wants his paintings, so after a little argument, he gives them a revolver. Now they're happy. They're walking out of Al's house, they look inside the revolver, it's empty. Where's our bullets? Another argument ensues, and Al gives them one bullet. And he gives them the bullet with an uh, instructions, very explicit instructions, do not shoot anybody. So the thieves go to the museum, middle of the day, around noontime, they pull up in their station wagon, they park at the main entrance, which is right outside these doors, and they walk into the museum. Now, if you've been there, you know the Dutch paintings are up on the second floor. And the thieves go exactly to the second floor, exactly where they're supposed to be, they know which paintings they're supposed to take, and they do it. And nobody says a word to them. You take the four paintings down, put them in their velvet bags, uh, but they do some things that aren't in line with what you see in movies. This is a little hard because I'm Italian and I have to keep using my hands. So one of the things they do is, is as they're walking up to the second floor towards their targeted paintings, these guys are younger, they're in their early 20s, and they see two high school seniors who happen to be female and happen to be attractive. So. Even though they have this heist that they're supposed to pull off, they stop and say to the girls, 
hey, you should sit down over here. Something big's going to happen. Not exactly what you saw in Ocean's Eleven, right? So the girls sit down and they watch. They take, when these guys take the paintings, they come back down the stairs. And uh, at the time, this, this is one of the world's great Antioch mosaics in Worcester. They have one of the world's best collections. And these rails were not there at the time. The thieves come down the stairs. They're heading towards the exit, and they walk onto the mosaic. They get halfway across the mosaic, and a guard at the front door sees them, and he yells to them to stop. And they stop in their tracks. And he says, get off the mosaic. So you're halfway across. You've got to keep walking anyway. They get closer to him, and that slows them down enough for him to see they're carrying these bags. And he realizes these may be paintings, so he yells to them again. And what do they do? They take the gun and they shoot him with their one bullet. They shoot him in the hip. And he hits the floor, and there's lots of blood. Fortunately for the guard, his name is Phil Evans. He had, he had been giving directions to the museum to a visitor when he was shot, and she was a nurse, and she saved his life. Any nurses in the audience? Great, isn't that, isn't that great? So, Phil survived. These two guys are, have their paintings down. They go out to the car. It's a horrible scene, of course. They put the three smaller paintings in the back seat. The driver gets behind the wheel, and his cohort takes the big Gauguin painting. You remember why I told you he stole the station wagon? He takes the big Gauguin painting, he puts it on the roof of the car and gets in, gets in the car, holds it like this. Again, just like the movies, right? Just like, just like Pierce Brosnan. So the, the driver doesn't think anything of it either because he's a rocket scientist, of course, and he hits the gas and the car jerks and the painting falls off the roof. So the, the thief sees he's made a mistake here. That didn't work. So he picks up the painting, what does he do? He puts it back on the roof again. But this time he takes off and he gets away with the stolen Gauguin and, and uh, Rembrandt, uh, Picasso, millions of dollars worth of art. They take the paintings to their, uh, to, they, they take them in the getaway car, they take them to Al. He puts them in the drop ceiling of his house in Worcester. And they drop off the getaway car and they get in their own car. And it's not even 2 o'clock yet, so what do they do? They go to the local watering hole in Worcester. They go into the place, everybody knows them there. The place is packed, it's two o'clock, it's Worcester. That's, how, that's what they do. And um, no offense to anybody from Worcester. But the place was packed, it's two o'clock in the afternoon. They sit down, they're very proud of themselves. For all their bumbling, they pulled off one of the world's biggest art heists. So they're having a celebratory drink, and all of a sudden, breaking news on the television in the bar. There's been an art theft at the Worcester Art Museum, Guard has been shot. He's in critical condition. The FBI and Worcester police are on scene. Millions of dollars worth of art stolen. Uh, suspect still at large. Details at six. And the whole place just hushes. Because this is big news anywhere, never mind just Worcester. So these guys realize, whoa, this is a big story. So what do they do? They do what any schooled and intelligent thief would do. They said, hey, that was us in the bar. So with all due respect to the police, that was a good lead. That's a good lead. So they, these two guys get arrested. This is the painting of uh, St. Bartholomew by Rembrandt. Now the interesting thing is that when I did this study, I found three art thefts that really stood out. And I'm gonna talk about them tonight because I think they're the most significant thefts and they all include Rembrandt and they all happened here in the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This is St. Bartholomew, and Rembrandt painted St. Bartholomew three times in his career. They're all magnificent. They're all basically this type of portrait um, from the midsection up. And you can't see it here from where you're sitting probably, but St. Bartholomew is holding a flaying knife here. It's very difficult to see. And the reason he's holding that is because the great masters painted modern saints with or holding standing there, the instrument of their martyrdom. So St. Bartholomew was skinned alive. So he's holding a flaying knife in his painting. And this one really speaks to me. I love Rembrandt. I love this painting. And when I was a kid in Rhode Island, I went to St. Bartholomew Elementary School, grades one to eight. And I remember 40 years ago, 
being in the first grade and Sister Martina telling us that St. Bartholomew was skinned alive. Because when you're six, something that sticks with you for a while leads to a lot of sleep, sleepless nights. So this is a special painting. Now, if you've seen the movie American Hustle, um, they, they look at this painting in the movie. They go to the Worcester Art Museum, and Christian Bale's character tells Bradley Cooper's character that this is a fake. And I'm here to tell you, it is not a fake. It is the real deal. And it's unbelievable. Next time you're in Worcester, you have, to, you have to look at it again. So now the paintings are in Al Monday's drop ceiling. The police go and visit him because they know these two guys that they arrested were part of his gang, right? Al is really upset that they shot the guard. And he told me they put blood on the paintings. And he didn't mean literally, he meant figuratively, now this is a major crime. He didn't care about the guard. Right? I, I remember interviewing him about this and saying, now you know, now this brings in a lot more cops and this and that. And I'm like, yes, Al, but they shot an innocent guy. They didn't have to shoot him. He couldn't have stopped him. So he has them, the cops come to his house, they talk to him, and he told me when they were interviewing him at his front door, the paintings were above his head. So they let him know they're on to him, and uh, they go away. And he says, I have to move these paintings. Now, if you study art or you read about art, you always hear about this, um, par uh, this uh, dichotomy between the sacred and the profane when you talk about great art. And this is the best example. He took these four paintings, including that Rembrandt, and hid them here at the Pachillo Pig Farm in Johnston, Rhode Island. Now, this is another place with a, with a connection to my youth because I, I grew up not far from this place. And at the time this Rembrandt and the others were hidden, hidden in a hayloft here, it was the most polluted site in the United States of America. It's America's first EPA Superfund site. And this is where he chose to hide great masterpieces. But now they're safe and the police don't know where they are because the cops have to do what cops do, good cops. They dot the I's and cross the T's, they go through procedure, they use the courts for, for subpoenas and for search warrants. But now, you know, not only did the police know Al was probably involved, other bad guys know he was probably involved too. So there's two particularly violent criminals who are facing sentencing and uh, they're thinking of a way that they can curry some favor with the judge and it strikes them, this is on the front page of the paper every day. Why don't we see if we get these paintings back? Maybe the judge will give us a break. So these guys go to Al and they do what the cops can't do. They ring his doorbell, he opens the door, they stick a gun in his ribs, and say, take us to the paintings. So Al gets in the car, they drive to Johnston. He gives them the paintings, the guys bring the paintings back. And um, the judge gives them a, a small break in their sentencing. Everybody lives happily ever after. Paintings go back on the wall. Al flees the country and goes and hides up in Montreal and takes on a new identity. He called himself Rock Poulin, and he did petty crimes up in Canada. If, if you guys remember the Medfield State Hospital, where they used to send prisoners, Al was sent there and he was eventually arrested. He got a nine-year sentence, and while he was there, he saved somebody's life, and they cut his sentence on him. He was out in less than two years for masterminding one of the biggest art thefts at the time in the shooting of a guard, only in Massachusetts. Now, I know Al really well, and uh, despite all the stuff, I like him. He's entertaining to talk to, and he, but he's a great self-aggrandizer, and he always tells me there were 200 investigators looking for these paintings when they were lost. And this, this is a picture of the paintings being recovered and the 200 investigators that were looking for them. You can see here, uh, this is the big Gauguin that was supposed to be in the back. That was on the roof of the car. And here's the Rembrandt. And you can see there's no frame because Al felt that, felt that the frame was weighing him down and he took it off the painting and threw it in the Blackstone River. So that's gone. Um, but the painting's back and you should really check it out. Now, the reason I, I feel it's important to talk to you about this art heist is because not only is it a major art heist in, in in a place familiar to many of you, but it's the first time in history that a museum in precious art was stolen at gunpoint. It's the first armed robbery of a museum, 1972. Al was on the Keith Oberman show one night bragging about how he invented an armed robbery of a museum. And I always like to say, Al, someone would have thought of it eventually. 
you know, you didn't cure cancer here. You, you held up a place with a gun. This is Phil Evans when the painting is returned. So he lived happily ever after, too. And this is the painting back of the wall in the new frame. Now, three years later, there was another major Rembrandt theft in Massachusetts. How many of you have been to the MFA? Almost everybody. I'm sad to see that it's about the same amount that I've been to the Gardner. Gardner should come first in your hearts and minds. Okay, I'm going to show you an overhead picture of the MFA here. That's the circular drive off the Fenway where those two big ridiculous baby heads are at that entrance. The reason I show you this overhead is because this, is, uh, this exemplifies what a great getaway spot this makes. If you park your car in that circular driveway and there's no traffic, you take off on the Fenway, that's a one-way road, that takes you to Starrow Drive, and you can go any, four, any of the four directions from Starrow Drive. So it's a great path to get away. And that's what thieves did in May of 1975, perhaps inspired by what uh, Al Mundy's guys did at the Worcester Art Museum, four guys pull up in that circular driveway, middle of the day again, broad daylight, but these guys really mean business. They're not bumblers like Al's guys. They run into the museum, second floor, and they pull this painting off the wall. At the time, in, in 75, this was called Portrait of Elizabeth Van Rijn. It was thought to be a painting by Rembrandt of his sister, and it was on loan to the MFA. It's on an oak panel, and it's a very precious painting. In the mid-70s, a group got together called the Rembrandt Research Project. All of the world's top Rembrandt experts decided it's about time that everybody in the, everybody in the world uh, says that they stop saying that they have a Rembrandt. At the turn of the last century, there were, there were about 2,000 or more paintings attributed to Rembrandt. Hardly... 30% uh, of those were, were Rembrandts, not even less than that. So someone had to go around and look at them and say, well, which ones are real and which ones are not? And this team did. When they came across this painting, they said, it is not Elizabeth Van Rijn. However, it's as fine an example of a Rembrandt painting as exists. To this day, they still use it to compare other Rembrandts too, because it's just a perfect example of his brush strokes, his genius, and it also, there's a companion piece of this woman by profile. Today it's called Portrait of a Girl Wearing a Gold Trim Cloak. It's not as nice as the title, but that's more accurate. So they took this painting, they run back down the stairs with their semi-automatic pistols, waving to the crowd. They run out the door and they fire shots to anybody who decides they're going to give chase. Because these guys meant business. These were violent criminals. Now, if any of you have ever volunteered at a museum or worked at one or you have a real affinity for art, you might understand this. People who work in museums fall in love with the paintings. And sometimes they fall in love with specific paintings. When I started at the Gardner and I wrote the emergency plan, you know, telling our employees what you have to do if there's an emergency, I put many times to remind people you may not go back and try to save paintings. A human life takes precedence. You have to leave the building because people will try. This guy, Mr. Monkowski, is a great example of people who will try. Despite the gunfire I mentioned, he chased after the painting in the face of semi-automatic weapons being fired at him. He got his hands on the painting when the guys got in the car, and it was a tug of war between him and the thieves. Finally, one of the thieves took his gun and put it to Mr. Monkowski's head, and he still didn't let go. I was going to fire, and the driver said, don't kill him. So he just smashed him in the head with the gun, and he finally let go. And that's why he's showing his injury on his head here. So this is a real pickle, folks. This painting's gone. Nobody knows who did it. There were no two dummies going into the bar and saying, we did that. There was no evidence left behind at the scene. Painting is gone. Nobody knows where these guys went, and there's not a whisper about it. So remember the time, I asked you to remember the time frame, 1975. And this Rembrandt has disappeared into thin air. A few years earlier, in 1973, this character, who you might have heard of before, Miles Connor, went up with a gang of thieves that he hung with. They went up to the Woolworth Estate in Monmouth, Maine. 
you hear, guys remember Woolworths? I love talking about Woolworths. Anyway, they go up to the estate, and in the middle of the night, they break in and they, they commit a robbery. They steal a grandfather clock. They steal some antique furniture, other antiques. And Miles, Connor, steals four paintings by the Wyatts, four very valuable, highly recognizable pieces of art. Now, what I want you to come away with tonight, if anything, is that when people steal masterpieces, highly recognizable, highly valuable pieces of art, the whole world imagines that they so sold them to like a Dr. No figure, or they sold them to some rich industrialist, and there's some guy sitting alone in his underground lair, drinking brandy, enjoying it for himself. That is 100% fictional. What you need to remember is that there are no buyers out there for great masterpieces. You can't sell them. People don't buy a, t uh, a hundred million dollar painting for $10 million or for $1 million so that they can hide it and never show anybody. There are no examples in history of anybody ever doing that, right? So what happens is these set their sights on these things. They believe they can find a buyer. Al Monday thought he could, but they can't. Why? Because there are no buyers. People buy these things to show them off. People don't buy Lamborghinis to hide them, right? They buy yellow ones and they drive them around and annoy people to be seen. Same thing with art. So Miles steals these masterpieces in 73 and he can't find anybody to buy those, of course, because they're too recognizable. But he keeps trying and all the while he's doing all other types of crimes. Miles, Miles is a career criminal. He's done everything. He had a shootout with the police along the, the rooftops of Boston back in the late 60s. He shot a state trooper. He's implicated in the murder of two teenage girls. He's just a horrible guy. He's involved in drugs. He's robbed everything from grocery stores to armored cars, you name it. He was arrested a year ago for stealing cell phones. He just can't control himself. And now here he is with these four masterpieces that he can't sell. He keeps trying, though. He has a large criminal network, and he keeps looking. And then one day, in 1976, he comes across a guy who might be interested in buying his Wyatt paintings. And now Miles is thinking, I'm going to make a score, finally. The guy's name is Bernie. And he sets up an appointment with Bernie to meet at a grocery store parking lot early morning on a Sunday down on the Cape. Miles is very excited. He might be able to get rid of these things. At the appointed time, Miles is there, and the guy Bernie shows up. They get out of the car, they talk. Miles feels him up, uh, feels him out a little bit, and says, "All right, this is the right guy. Maybe we could do something here." Hmm. He tells him the price, and Bernie agrees to it, provided he has the art that he says he has. So Miles opens the trunk, and there it is. And Bernie is just taken aback. He's like, "I've been looking for these. This is what I want. You got a deal." So Miles grabs the paintings to give to him. Bernie grabs his FBI badge and says, you're under arrest. Now, now why, did Bernie, why was Bernie an FBI agent? Because there are no buyers for these things, right? There, there's no one out there who's going to buy them. So Miles is in big trouble now. It's 1976. He's got all kinds of criminal uh, convictions in his background. He's in a world of trouble. And he's also out on bail for a state charge. Now, all the prosecutors hate this guy. And now they have their chance. They want the state to sentence him, and then the feds to sentence him, and they'll run consecutively, and he'll be away for a very long time. And Miles knows that he's red-handed. The best he can do are concurrent sentences, so he serves them both at the same time. They'll get out quicker. So he has some pull because his father was a cop in Milton, and he has a brother who is a state trooper and one who is a priest. And as Miles always says, I don't know where they all went wrong. So using his connections, he gets an appointment with an investigator for the uh, Norfolk County um, District Attorney's Office. And he pleads his case. He's saying, I cannot serve consecutive sentences. Please help me. I want to get these sentences concurrent. What can I do? And the guy tells him, listen, Miles, they got you dead to rights. There's nothing you can do. This time, you know, your goose is cooked. So Miles turns away dejectedly and leaves the office. Just before he gets out, the guy says to him, you know, unless you can find a st uh, stolen Rembrandt or something, maybe that will get you off on this because, 
you know, after all, this is an art crime, and if you can come up with a Rembrandt or something. And Miles leaves the office, and he gets out into the hallway, and a light bulb goes off in his head, and he says, wait a minute, I have a stolen Rembrandt. Because in 75, his guy stole this. So again, in a great example of how art theft really happens, he has to get it back now. Now you think, well, where would it be? Is it in a safe underground somewhere? Is it um, hidden off in a castle somewhere like you would see in movies? Um, did, he, did he put it in the hands of some Japanese industrialist like you see in films? No. Miles called his friend Al and said, I need the Rembrandt. Al drove from Quincy to the North End to his mother's apartment on Hanover Street, went upstairs, went under the bed, took the painting out, and they turned it in. And Miles got his concurrent sentences. And that's how art theft really happens. That's where these things get hidden. You know, when you're looking for a stolen painting, you're not, you're not thinking, wow, there's um, you know, some uh, um, biometrics you have to go and they scan your eye and then you put your hand on this, you say a secret password and the painting's behind some, you know. No, it's under somebody's bed above a restaurant in the North End. In some ways, that makes it even harder. Now, the reason I told you this story is not only because it's quirky, but because it's a very significant theft in art history. It's the first time on a big scale that somebody uses a stolen painting to bother with prosecutors. And to this day, one of the leading reasons, one of the chief reasons that criminal organizations steal art is to use it as a get out of jail free card. So if you're a gang, and I'm not talking about the mafia, I'm talking about a gang of low level crooks who are doing things all day long. If you know that, you know, eventually you're gonna get arrested for something, you want some insurance policy, well, you steal a high value piece of art, and if you get arrested, you make a deal, and, and you give it back, and everything goes away. Art theft is vastly underreported, and recoveries are even less reported. So if you find out a place got its painting back, a lot of times you can't get the details, because that sort of thing's involved. Now, just so I don't hurt your um, ego too much, I want you to know that Rembrandts have been stolen elsewhere, not just Massachusetts. This painting, Man Leaning on a Sill, was stolen from the Taft Museum in Cincinnati, 1973. Uh, guy, a guy was told if he could steal them that a well-known stolen goods fence would move them for him. He stole them. The guy couldn't, what are, you, what are you crazy? I can't move these things, they're too valuable. They're too well-known. Now, this is the guy who stole the paintings in Cincinnati. And today, if you're looking for some real estate, he's the sales vice president at Huff Realty. And he was able to, I like this right here, oh, by the way, I'm never too busy for your referrals, including that referral to steal those Rembrandts in 1973. Um, he'd been living this nice, quiet life as a real estate guy until I called him one day saying, hey, Carl, are you the one that stole those paintings in Cincinnati? Yeah, why? Well, I'm writing this book. Oh, no. But this was on the internet, so it wasn't much you could do. This painting is called uh, Portrait of Jacob de Gein. A very significant piece in um, Rembrandt's body of work because it shows that he would do these things on commission for uh, special people. And uh, Jacob de Gein was best friends with Constantine Huygens' brother. Constantine Huygens is the guy that discovered Rembrandt. He was like a talent scout for the Prince of Orange. So Rembrandt paints this, and in 1966, it was stolen from the Dulwich Picture Gallery in Britain. Take that and other paintings were taken right off the wall, off these wires, this is the curator the next morning, by a guy that the press called a rubber bone thief. And they called him that because how he got into the building was he cut this hole in the employee entrance. Very, it was a small hole, and he crawled through it, and then he stole paintings that were small enough to take back out the hole in the door. And that's what he did, and he took off with them. And I always wondered, after I heard this, why didn't he just open the door on his way out? He already broke in. Why did he have to crawl out the hole? But that's what he did. And um, the police came, and they solved the theft in a really unique way. They did it in a way that it would only have been done by old-time investigators, and we don't do enough nowadays. He used his brain instead of technology. The investigator in Britain noted on the floor that there were mud footprints left by the thief talked to the facilities people and said, how is this place heated? And they said, from below. Calculated how long that the mud was there by how dry it was. 
Using that time frame, he set up a perimeter around the museum. Using that perimeter, they found the getaway car, which they tied to the thief, and they got the paintings back. Nowadays, it would be, let's put this in this database. Let's analyze the mud. What type of shoe was it? How big is his foot? Meanwhile, this guy just, you know, he did, he did old-fashioned detective work. This is a picture of the door. That's the way to get the uh, guy got in. In fact, I'm not sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure this cop here is saying, hey, boss, this is how he got in, because that's the hole, that's the hole in the door. Um, now, that seems like an insignificant theft because it happened 81 times, but here's why I like to point this one out. That painting is called the Takeaway Rembrandt, because when they got it back in 66, you would think they would have secured it well, but in 69, it was stolen again. A guy walked into the museum, just took it right off the wall, put it on his uh, basket on his bicycle, and rode off. And the people in the museum were just looking at each other. They called the police. The police came really quickly, and they actually drove up alongside this guy on his bicycle with a painting. And I, I can't tell the story without grinning, because I just picture that scene, you know, the guy riding his bike quickly, and the police just like coasting in their car, looking at him, and them looking back and forth at each other. I love that. It sounds like something from a film. So they pull him over, and uh, they ask him, what are, you, what are you doing? And he said, I was just taking it home to sketch it. So they took it back. So the reason that's important is because it's not only these thieves, these vicious, violent criminals who steal art, it's also nut jobs, too. A lot of times, nuts, nut jobs go to museums and steal paintings, or they deface them. In 1972, a, a nut job went into the Gardner in the blue room and sliced two paintings. They repaired them because these people are magicians at the museums that fix these things, but it happens very often. If you've been to the Louvre, you know what you have to go through to see the Mona Lisa. And it takes away so much that you're so far from it, it's behind glass and the rest. I wish that was the end of the story, but 1986, Portrait of Jacob de Guy was stolen a third time from the Dulwich Picture Gallery. Now, as someone who's been in the security business for 20 some odd years, I can tell you. That's embarrassing. <laughs> if that happened to me, I would have resigned after the first one. Three times. And then it was stolen a fourth time, 1989. Now, the last two times it was stolen, the thieves tried, thought that they could make money off it. They tried to sell it. It was a, uh, organized gangs. And both times they gave up. They put the, they gave the, the paintings back. They left it in a cab and in a bus depot and called the authorities and said, take it back. There's no way to sell it. It's too recognizable, right? You all learned that a few minutes ago? Too valuable, too recognizable. That's one of the other Rembrandts that was stolen. In 1939, thieves broke into this gigantic castle, Chillum Castle in Britain, owned by Sir Edmund Davis. And this place looks like, at the beginning, Harry Potter, that gigantic castle. So huge, in fact, that when the thieves broke in, they busted windows, they ransacked the place. You can see the mess they made. Frames on the floor, broken frames, frames off the wall. And they, they busted windows. This place had three families and six dogs living in it, and nobody heard it. It was around Christmas time, and Sir Edmund had a lot of guests. And this is the scene when he woke up the next morning. Now, the reason I, I like to point this one out to you is that of the 81 Rembrandt thefts that I cataloged, this is the only time the painting was destroyed. The thieves took 19 pieces, and as the police were closing in on them, they panicked and they burned this painting. Saskia at her toilet. Now, this is a real sad example of art crime, because this is all that's left of that painting. You can't see it again. This is the only image that exists until this photographer has taken another one. I have this. You're welcome. Thanks for ruining my story. There's only three versions now. <laughs> um, but as, as many of you know, when you think about great art, a lot of you have favorite paintings in your mind, things that really speak to you. And you do everything you can to have a copy of it in your home or what have you, right? But it's never exactly the same as the real painting. You could go to the Gardner and get a copy of the self-portrait by Rembrandt still is hanging on the walls, right? But you can take it home, and it's beautiful, but it's not the real thing. You can never match the real thing, and this is gone forever. 
right? So our director at our museum, Ann Hawley, often says that's like, if imagine if Beethoven's Fifth Symphony just disappeared forever, and you could never hear it again. All that's left is what's in your memory, and it fades over time. Or you could never read Macbeth again. That's what happens when you lose a great painting like this. Fortunately, that's the only one that I found that was destroyed, though. Now, in the year 2000, there was a theft that seemed like something out of movies. It was in uh, Stockholm. Has anybody been to the National Museum in Stockholm? So you know, it's on a peninsula, right? It's this beautiful palatial museum, but it's one road in and one road out. It's a U-shaped road that runs along the coast. And what these clever thieves did was, just a couple of days before Christmas at rush hour, they stole two cars, and they parked them just north of the museum, and they blew them up. So now you have all this traffic, <clears throat> excuse me, and you have the police and the fire department on scene. No one can get it in or out from the museum. Just before the museum is about to close, a speedboat approaches the peninsula. Four guys jump off. They're dressed all in black, like in the movies, and they have submachine guns, and they go into the museum, and they get everybody on the floor. And they go and they steal this painting and three others. They're in and out of the place in three minutes, which is common. When people rob museums, it's three minutes, five minutes, maybe six or seven minutes maximum. Now, this is a very important Rembrandt self-portrait because it's painted on copper. He only painted four pieces on copper, and he had a really special technique. He would take the piece, on top of the copper, he'd put a thin layer of gold, and then he'd paint his subject. And Rembrandt paintings are really noted for a lot of paintings that are impressed by how the light plays on the subject. Rembrandt's, the light comes from the subject. So imagine it on copper. So this thing disappears. And it seems like the perfect bet, right? But here's where it went awry. When the thieves got their paintings, they were hooting and hollering on the way from the museum to their boat. And someone on the dock noticed them. The police finally arrived, and he identifies the boat for them. The cops search the channel. They find the boat. They put it on the front page of the paper the next day, and they immediately get a call. The guy calls them up and says, that used to be my boat. I just sold it to a bunch of guys. Police rush out to see the guy, and they say, who'd you sell it to? He said, I don't know their names, but here's their cell phone number. Now, of course, like if you were writing a, a fiction novel, a thriller, you would assume, well, it must be a fake phone number, a pay phone, a neighbor's phone, a drop phone. No, these knuckleheads gave their real cell phone number. That led the police on the route to a Bulgarian drug gang. They used some of the paintings to bother uh, to, uh, as collateral to get drugs. And three of the paintings were found in Los Angeles. This one was recovered in Copenhagen. The bad guys, the Bulgarians, found a buyer. They found a buyer from the mafia. This guy was an art buyer for the mafia. So they're in this hotel room in Copenhagen, and the art buyer for the mob takes the painting, and he's checking it with a black light and with a loop like a jeweler would use. And when he realizes this is the real thing, he yells out to the guys, it's the real thing. And just then, a SWAT team crashes into the room and arrests everybody and take the painting back. Can anybody guess why the SWAT team came in? Because the guy that said it's the real thing was not an art buyer for the mafia. He was an FBI agent working in Copenhagen. You're disappointing me, Wolverine. Let me give you another lesson. The mafia does not employ art buyers, okay? They employ leg breakers, bookies, murderers, extortionists, drug dealers, pimps, no art buyers, no openings. The Bulgarians should have known that. Now they're in jail. Now, for those of you who have art in your home, you should know that more than half of all art thefts occur um, when thieves steal art from people's homes. That's the number one way at this six to eight billion dollars a year worth of art is trafficked out of your home. And a lot of times, if it, if it comes my way, my first question will be, who are your contractors? And most people don't do enough due diligence when they check their contractors. So many people are so happy to show their electrician the Matisse drawing their mother, their grandmother left them as they're walking them up the stairs. And then one day that Matisse drawing disappears 
that's what happens. So my little caveat to you is know who you're talking to if you have precious items in your home. Don't just show them to anybody. Rembrandt's own house in Amsterdam has been robbed a number of times. No paintings there, but etchings like Fall of Man and the print dealer, Clement de Young, have been stolen from his home. That brings us to March 18, 1990, the most significant art theft in history. It was mentioned that it was $500 million worth of art, at least. That's an important figure. When people mention the Godner heist, and they say to me, wow, but isn't that, wasn't that like the biggest art theft in American history? Or one of the biggest art thefts in history? I get a little defensive. It's, that's the understatement of the year. Okay? The Godner heist was the biggest theft of anything ever, anywhere. Not just art, not just America, anything. Over half a billion dollars worth of property, right here in our own backyard. Okay? Many of you associate the theft with St. Patrick's Day. It technically wasn't St. Patrick's Day. It was the next morning, at 1.24 in the morning. And if you don't know the story or don't know it well, uh, two guys approached the employee entrance on Palace Road, dressed as police officers, and they rang the employee entrance buzzer and told the guard, um, we have a report of a disturbance. And based on that, the guard let them in, buzzed them into the building against protocol, against all policy and training. The correct procedure, I'm not giving anything away, is this is common everywhere, is if you're an overnight guard and the police come and you didn't call them, you call the police and check were they, were they dispatched here. They didn't do that, and when he let them in, it was a fait accompli. There was nothing that was going to stop him at that point. There were no more layers of security. This guy made the biggest mistake in the history of property protection by letting them in the museum. The thieves, the police, uh, the thieves dressed as police, took the two guards on duty, and they said to them, um, a little small conversation, and finally they said, there's a warrant out for you. Assume the position. So one of the guards protested a bit. They stood up against the wall with their hands on against the wall. The thieves handcuffed the guys, and then they told them, gentlemen, this is a robbery. And they took them down in the basement. They put duct tape all over them cover their eyes and their mouth, put duct tape over their handcuffs, and then chained them to pipes in this basement. And then went on to steal 13 great masterpieces from the Godner. The theft took 81 minutes. So remember what I told you about how long these museum thefts usually happen, right? There's no doubt in anyone's mind, there shouldn't be, and I know there's none of mine, that the thieves had some modicum of inside information. They have more than a modicum. They knew a lot about procedures. They knew it, it, they knew um, that there were only two guards on duty. They knew that the guard didn't hit the duress button. They knew it was safe to go into the basement. Seasoned criminals will not go into an old basement on a whim because they know there's only one way in and one way out. So they knew it was safe to do it. And they were in the museum for an incredibly long time, which means they were comfortable. So someone must have given them some information, maybe unwittingly. The FBI estimates that around 90% of all museum thefts include inside information. But that could be a guy who just quit there a year ago talking out of school to one of his buddies at a bar, and someone overhears him. So this is a picture of the guard who let the thieves into the building. You can see the duct tape on him, on his face, he's still handcuffed. Now, I know it was mentioned already, but I have to repeat, I was not the security director in 1990. <clears throat> this picture always reminds me to tell you, because I would never tolerate red corduroys on the job. Fanny pack, the sign of the times, I guess. Grateful Dead concert tickets. That was not the regulation haircut at the time either. <clears throat> but this is uh, the one who let them in, and he's chained down in the basement by the boiler room. These are the three Rembrandts that we lost that night. And you can see um, really impressive students. First of all, when I first saw them early, you told me your class did them. I thought this, this, these were high school students. I can't believe these are eighth graders that did this. This is amazing. Easily the coolest backdrop to any talk I've ever given in my life. <clears throat> so you can see up here, self-portrait etching by Rembrandt. 
In reality, it's about two inches by two inches. And uh, we stole them once before in 1979 by a group of high school students who distracted a guard by throwing a, a light bulb on the floor. And when the guard went over to, to see what the noise was, a couple of the other kids took the, took the etching off the uh, cabinet it was on. And you can see the students did some really impressive copies of it here. They're uh, fledgling forgers. Barbara Shapiro can write a follow-up about. <clears throat> any, any of your students ask you about the ethics of forging these paintings? They did, good. It's good to know you have ethical kids in Uber. This painting here is Lady and Gentleman in Black. It's very big, it's over four feet tall. This is one of the paintings that was cut out of its frame. So they took the frame off the wall, put it on the floor, and sliced it out with what I think is probably a box cutter, probably. <clears throat> and here's a copy of that here, and I'm really impressed that. Imagine being in the eighth grade and saying, I'm going to take on this painting. Try to cut. I mean, that's really impressive. Those kids really should. I wish they were here. <clears throat> and then this one here in the center is Storm in the Sea of Galilee, which is probably most recognizable to you in the Gardner uh, heist uh, mythology. And someone tried that one here, too. Really impressive. I was telling uh, somebody before the talk that one of my daughters made a crayon drawing of this when she was five. And I pulled it out the other day, and I noticed she wrote, when she was five, she wrote My Mystery on it, which was really cool. <clears throat> so this one is five feet by four feet. It's a really big painting. Also cut from its frame, tragically, but reparable. And it is the second most valuable stolen painting in the world. It's worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And it's that valuable, not just because it's part of the Gardner Heist and it's one of uh, a big painting, but it is the only time in all of Rembrandt's body of work that he painted a seascape. So think about the enormity of that. The world's greatest painter paints the sea, the, a seascape one time in 1633. And it stays in Amsterdam, and someone puts it in their home in Amsterdam with no locks on the doors, no alarms, right? no security systems. They smoke in the home. They have fireplaces. They're not worried about, they don't have climate control. And for 300 years, it stays unmolested and in perfect condition, comes to Boston, Massachusetts. 87 years later, see you later. Think about that. Think about what that says about us, right? That's why we all need to remain committed to getting these things back. So it's the second most valuable stolen painting in the world. Rembrandt painted himself amongst the disciples here as they're approaching Christ. So there's actually uh, 13 disciples on the, on the boat. And Mrs. Godner positioned this one directly across from his own self-portrait. So Rembrandt's looking at himself back and forth across the room. These are the other pieces that were stolen that night. Now, I mentioned that the Storm of the Sea of Galilee is the second most valuable stolen painting in the world. This is the first. So the top two are both taken from the Gardner. This is the concert by Johannes Vermeer. And if you know Vermeer, you know how incredibly important this painting is. 35 or 36 known Vermeers in the world. Um, if you saw The Monuments Men, if you saw that movie, they, there's a few Vermeers in that. But the concert is one of his greatest works. And the only Vermeer in Boston, and stolen in 1990. By far the most valuable stolen painting in the world. The white whale of my life, of anybody who looks for stolen art, is this painting. One of the neat little things in this painting is that this, this one here that he put in the background appears in two of his works, and it's called The Procurus by Dirk Van Baberen. And that painting he copied right out of his mother-in-law's kitchen. He put, he put it in another painting. And today, that actual painting is at the MFA. So across the street from each other was that and the concert. And it's a great indication of the MFA and the Godner, too. We have the concert by Vermeer. And the MFA has that other thing that was in the background. These here are Degas pieces. And they all feature horses. This is uh, three seated jockeys. Might be familiar to someone in our audience. This is a uh, program for an artistic soiree. This one blows me away because this is here. 
in here, and these, all three of them are dead ringers for the real thing. Dead ringers. Please tell your students, I'm just like, oh my God. Um, just incredible. There are two of these that were taken, so they got made two versions of this. They were both stolen that night. This, uh, these two pieces, uh, this is a, a Japanese, uh, I'm sorry, a Chinese beaker called a Ku, and this is a Napoleonic finial that was taken from the short gallery. This painting here is a landscape by Govert Flink. I mentioned the Rembrandt Research Project earlier, the group that would go around and authenticate Rembrandt paintings. This was bought by Mrs. Gardner thinking it was a Rembrandt, but it was not. It's by one of his students, Flink. And over some time, at some point in history, someone painted an R on the painting, which made people think it was Rembrandt, but it was not. <clears throat> it's still one of the great landscapes in the world, and it's still worth millions of dollars. Now, one of the paintings that the students really like to copy was this, Shea Tortoni by Manet, Edward Manet. And you can see them here. These are really unbelievable. There's another one here. Just absolutely worth stealing. An important thing I want you to note, though, is the enormity of the Gardner theft, the enormity of the loss, okay? This painting here, Shea Tortoni, is not known to many people. There are many hundreds of thousands of people who love it, but if I didn't show it to you tonight and they weren't up here on the stage and I asked you to name the 13 stolen pieces, who would say Shea Tortoni? Very few of them. What I want you to know is that if that was the only one stolen that night, if they stole one painting, Shea Tortoni, this would still be one of the largest unsolved art heists in the world. This would be one of the most important missing paintings in the world. Instead, it's just one of 13. That's how massive the loss at the Gardner was. I hope that gives you some sense of scale. It's worth many, many millions of dollars. And you can tell it's a really a beautiful painting because a number of kids in the eighth grade looked at it and said, I want to copy it, and did so really well. <coughs> This is uh, Detective Carl Washington. So what you're looking at is a crime scene photo from March 18, 1990, when the police realized we've been robbed. And he's the Boston police officer before the FBI took over the case. He's on the scene. Right here on the left is the frame that held Lady and Gentleman in black. So you, what you can see there is the frame and the stretcher that the canvas was on. The paintings cut out. This is the frame that held the concert by Vermeer. And first thing that this picture tells me is that the painting probably wasn't damaged by the glass. The glass was broken when the frame fell because it's all contained inside the frame. So I'm not worried about it being damaged. That's, this part here is broken frame. This is a dust cover from behind the Vermeer. This is the frame that held the flink landscape. And this big frame is the one that held Storm in the Sea of Galilee. And you can see the painting is missing inside. You can also see this door is open. That's a hidden door in the wall, so the thieves knew somehow about this hidden door. This is a picture that makes me cringe every time. <clears throat> you won't see this anywhere else, and please don't take a photo. Uh, don't take a photo of it. Of this one, thanks. What you're looking at is um, the Storm in the Sea of Galilee. A close-up. This is a crime scene photo. This is the frame. This is the stretcher that the painting was on. The canvas was on this stretcher. This is the floor in the Dutch room at the Godner. And this black strip is what remains of Storm of the Sea of Galilee. So you can see the cut is straight. It's not a jagged edge like people imagine. They must have used a very sharp instrument. There's a lot that there's a lot of clues and a lot of information in this picture. <clears throat> I can't share with you the most vital pieces, but I'll give you some little tidbits. Number one, this picture tells me that the painting probably was not rolled. Everybody imagines these paintings being rolled up and put in a tube. First of all, in 1990, I don't even know if you could find a tube that would hold a five foot by four foot painting. But the reason I, one of the reasons I'm sure it's not rolled, right? I believe it's not rolled, is what I've done is taken what's remaining of the painting and measured how thick it is. And I've talked to the conservators who've worked on it and we know that the canvas was relined. A lot of times when you care for an old painting like this, what the conservators will do to make sure it doesn't start to sag is they'll use animal glue, thick animal glue on the back, and put another canvas. So 
So that makes it pretty thick. It becomes like a piece of cardboard. So imagine you cut out a piece of cardboard and you started to roll it. Right away you'd realize mistake. It's not, it's not going to roll and you'd see damage, right? Paint chips would fall off it, big chips. You don't see any paint chips here. There were some paint chips recovered on the scene, but they're almost microscopic. They're specks. And I always pictured bigger chips. There's nothing like that. So I don't believe they rolled. Uh, another thing that, uh, that's important to note about this is you can see the way they cut kind of pulls here. So another reason I think they use a very sharp instrument went very deep because it kind of pulls the canvas out a little here. Like if you're cutting something and you come around the corner on it. So when you go to the museum today, you'll see this frame still on the wall. You don't see the stretcher, of course, but you see the frame, the empty frames hanging on the wall. And that's, uh, that's where it came from. A friend of mine who, who mentored me into the art theft world was an investigator from Scotland Yard who's recovered a number of paintings. And he recovered a da Vinci that had been rolled. And he told me every few inches you see this white blank where the paint chips had fallen off. Right, so I don't think I don't think ours are rolled or damaged in that way. Now I want to wrap up with a, a story about the future of art theft and the future of finding stolen paintings and what happens. In 2011, three weeks after my book came out announcing 81 Rembrandt thefts, there was an 82nd in Marina del Rey, California. Someone went to a exhibition. There were 20 drawings at this exhibition at a hotel, a nice hotel in Marina del Rey, a room smaller than this, and they were all lined up and stole this drawing attributed to Rembrandt called The Judgment. And the press right away said what the press says. Every time paintings are stolen, they say it must have been professional art thieves. Well, I can tell you, aside from Miles Connor, there's very few people who've ever stolen paintings more than once because they realized you can't make money doing it. And they say it was a master plan. This was a masterful theft. Here, this was the masterful theft they pulled off. There's one curator in the room alone with 20 paintings. Two guys walk in. One brings the curator down to this drawing. The other one takes that drawing and runs out of the room. That's the masterful theft. That's how I used to steal baseball cards when I was a little kid at the pharmacy down in the corner. So this painting was recovered, and here's how. When, uh, the, when it was stolen, the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department was the investigative agency. And they have a public affairs person who's a genius with social media. And he blasted this image and this information about this theft all over the world. It was on every newscast, and it was on every website you can imagine. Within something like 12 hours, there was some, something that, uh, along the lines of 300,000 hits for this image. At the same time, the LA media was calling me because of the book. Gardner, and they said, you know, I coordinated with the L.A. County Sheriff's before they called me, and they asked me, you know, all questions about theft, and etc. and every time I'd say the same thing, I have a message for the thieves, you've not stolen a picture, you've stolen a problem. Give it back before you get caught. Just leave it somewhere and call the police and hope this whole thing goes away. And 36 hours later, the thieves left it at a church in Marina del Rey and called the police and it was recovered. So this is the painting being recovered in Los, Ange in Los Angeles County. This, uh, their press spokesman at the time is um, James Arness's son, Steve Arness. So I think with the advent of social media and electronic information age, the ability to blast out a high quality image to millions and millions of people instantaneously will change the face of um, the theft of masterpieces. But there will always be a market when you talk about paintings that aren't quite as recognizable but highly valuable, like landscapes, like Hudson River Valley type paintings, beautiful, valuable works of art, but you're not necessarily going to recognize one right away if you see it on the internet or on the news. So I hope I got across to you the point I always try to make about who really steals art and what becomes of it. I hope you understand now, after me droning on and on, that it's not these masterful thieves. It's not some cartel of art thieves. It's low-level criminals who think they can get rich stealing these things but never do. 
And uh, what's also important to remember, though, is that they don't destroy them because they're easy to hide. So that gives me great promise in terms of finding these Gardner paintings. My paintings are going to be recovered, I promise you. We have a $5 million reward for them. And that's not for the paintings, that's for information that leads to the recovery. So if someone calls me tomorrow and says, I believe these paintings are here and here's why, and I go and I get them, that person's going to be $5 million richer. So put your thinking caps on. Get ready to turn in your ex-boyfriend. Yes. So I, before I take this, I'm willing to answer any and all questions you have, but I first want to thank uh, everybody for coming out tonight. Thank you to the Library and Historical Society for having me. And um, thank you to the students. Thank you very much to the students. So do you have a question? That's a good question. The question is, is there a market overseas for paintings that are stolen here? And interestingly enough, there's been um, a landmark research done in the 70s that still holds true today, that when paintings are stolen in the United States, again, everything I talk about is to do with masterpieces, but this applies to almost all. When paintings are stolen in America, they stay in America. They don't go overseas. When paintings are stolen overseas, they often do come to America. And the reason why uh, has to do with border issues. So if you steal a painting in Los Angeles, and you, you can find a buyer in New York, you can bring that painting from Los Angeles to New York without anybody searching you, without anybody looking in luggage to see if you have a stolen painting. But if you steal a painting in Britain, so if you take a painting in London, and you want to sell it miles away, but only over in um, uh, Scotland, you might have to go through some type of controls. Or if you want to just take it two hours away to another country in the, in, in the EU, you still may have to go through customs. So if you take a painting in Europe, you might as well try to sell it in America or anywhere else. But in the United States, your market's big enough for it to stay here. I don't have any belief. Well, this is a good time for me to say this. I don't have any belief whatsoever that the paintings were taken by the IRA. Total fallacy. I have no belief that the paintings are overseas at all. And people have stopped asking this finally, thank you God. Whitey Bulger had nothing to do, nothing to do with the Godner theft. Zip. And no matter how many times I say that, people say, still say to me, you think you're going to get those paintings back when Catherine Gregg is released from print? No. No. No Whitey. Yes, sir. Extremely well. The question was about um, a newspaper reporter who was taken to a warehouse somewhere and shown what was purported to be the storm in the Sea of Galilee. And he reported in the Herald, a front page story, that he saw it. I think the headline said, we, we've seen it. I have a great advantage. That, uh, that newspaper reporter's name is Tom Mashburn. He was not hooded. And one of the reasons I've worked, worked with Tom on this book is because he has incredible integrity. Now, he was never blindfolded or hooded. He just will not reveal where he was brought because he gave his word as a journalist that he wouldn't. Um, however, I will tell you that I don't believe that what he saw was our painting. I have zero doubt that it was, that it was a copy. First of all, he was, it was shown to him very, very quickly. He had less than a minute to look at it by flashlight. That wasn't held by him. I kind of held it up for him to see with a flashlight kind of against it. Um, number two, the way he describes it unfurling, he, I'm not giving away anything here, he said it on TV. He describes the guy held it up and it, it unfurled and kind of flopped at the guy, at the holder's feet. There's no way our painting would do that. Just physically impossible for our painting to unroll that way. No, there was no hood. Uh, 
Well, I believe that you read a story that said that, but it wasn't written by Tom Mashburn. Tom, it's one of his, now, like I said, this thing about Whitey Bulger, wasn't Whitey? That's one of Tom's things. I was not blindfolded. Why do people keep saying I was blindfolded? He wasn't, he wasn't disguised or blindfolded. He knows exactly where he was. He wrote a long article about this whole affair in Vanity Fair and, dis, and says, I know where I, they brought me. I cannot disclose. Yes, ma'am. Had to be, did he, question had to do with, did he get to choose what he wanted to see? You know, did he say, show me this, and they showed him that? He wanted to see Storm in the Sea of Galilee, and they told him they could show him that. Key to that, though, is, and I don't, this is no criticism of Tom, who would know how to act in that situation? It's so bizarre, right? But if I could go back in time and say, Tom, ask to see another one, you know? But he didn't, and they had nothing else they could show him. Thank you, though. Great point. Yes, sir. The God your paintings? The question was, are any of the Godner paintings insured? And no, none of the 13 were insured. Um, many times museums have insurance for their art, always when the art is transported. Um, but it's cost prohibitive for a big museum or a, a well-regarded museum to insure everything because the paintings are just, I mean, the Gardner has billions of dollars worth of art, the premiums, worth, I can't imagine. Um, but, you know, the other argument, too, is oftentimes art is stolen thinking you can get the ransom from the insurance company, and that does happen. And the Tate, uh, the Tate uh, Museum in Britain, there were two Turner paintings stolen uh, in the early 2000s, and a friend of mine recovered them. And they paid a ransom for them, basically, uh, with insurance money. But we, we had no insurance on the paintings. And think about it. You might know Mrs. Gardner's will says you can never replace anything. You can never change anything. You can't even move a painting six inches to the right. You can't do it. And um, so why insure it? You know, we can't put anything up anyway. So no, there was no insurance on the Gardner paintings. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, so you might be referring, a year ago, next week, we had held a press conference. It was me, the FBI, U.S. Attorney, and we said, we know who stole the paintings. So we know who the culprits were, but we're not disclosing their names. It's a really valuable piece of information for us to hold back in the course of the investigation. But I, I mean, I'm not giving away anything by saying that they can't get us the paintings. The other thing to remember is the people who stole the art cannot be arrested for stealing the art. The statute of limitations ran out in 95. So if two guys came to us and said, you know, it, it didn't happen this way, but if they said, we stole the paintings, we just don't know where they are today, we couldn't do anything to them because the statute of limitations was up. So the, the whole task is getting the paintings, and especially for me. Because, and, and the FBI knows this, I'm very good friends with them in the U.S. Attorney's Office, we're very close. But I'll say, if they were standing here, I couldn't care less about prosecutions, I don't care about anybody going to jail, any arrests, just want to put the paintings back on the wall. So I'm in a better position than the feds are to get these back, because I can go to someone and say, just give me the paintings, I'll give you the reward. As long as you weren't the ones who stole them, we will not pay the people who stole the paintings, because that would be a ransom. We'll only pay for information that gets them back. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was basically the same question. But um, if you're interested in reading more about the Godner theft and you want to dig into it a little more, I would point you to the Boston Herald between 2008 when I met Tom Mashburg and around 2010 we worked really closely, and I gave them a lot of information that I wanted the public to know. And they did a lot of great stuff for us to help us and put information out there. You have to dig a little bit for it now, but if you read articles from that time, they're dead on for that period. I can't say the same for that other newspaper. 
like the Herald has has the stuff accurately. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Wow, that's per I wish I, I should have told you to ask that question. That was perfect. That was perfect. Yeah, I am. I just signed a contract to write a book. Um, same format as Healing Rembrandts, which is sort of an anthology, different examples on art scams. So it's a story about people who either forged art or used, used art in these uh, peculiar crimes to get to make money. So um, that'll come out next year. It's called The Scam Artists. Thanks. Thanks for the plug.